May I welcome you to this very special series called the Communion Series. Uh, it's a delight to have you with us, and may God richly bless you. In this series, we actually take communion. We have uh, the bread with us that we take communion, and we have the grape juice with us that we take uh, for the Holy Communion. And if you would like to participate in the communion with me, would you go to your kitchen this moment and secure a small piece of bread, a size of a dime or a five cent piece or something, small piece of bread, and would you get some grape juice and set it before you, and at the conclusion of our talk, we will partake together. It's a great joy to have you with us in this service because it means so much. It is one of the greatest blessings that we have in Christianity, and Christ Jesus is very much present in this meeting, in this service, and in these ordinance, and we believe that God will certainly bless you. Uh, to receive the Holy Communion is not optional. We are commanded to receive it. If you are a follower of the Lord, then you must receive it. We do not receive the Holy Communion because we are worthy. There are friends who say, I cannot take the communion. I do not feel worthy. Very likely, if you did feel worthy, then you would not be worthy. We are not worthy because of any great goodness upon our parts. We're worthy because the Lord Jesus Christ has purchased us with his own blood. He has forgiven us our sins. He has made us to be the children of God. And so we partake of it because of relationship. We're his, and how glad we are for it. Today's lesson is what means this feast? What do we mean when we talk about, about this feast uh, of, of the Lord's Supper? What is it all about, and how does it come to us? May I read to you first from the book of Exodus, chapter 12 and verse 26. That's the second book of the Bible, second book of Moses. Uh, in Exodus, chapter 12, verse 26. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed the head and worshipped. This is a tremendous uh, passage of the Holy Word of God. The people that lived at that moment in Egypt and experienced the passing of the death angel down their streets. And those that had the blood upon the lintels and upon the door were saved. And those that were, did not lost the firstborn in their family. Now, in a generation, they would still be partaking of this feast, and the children would not understand it. And so God said, for eternal generations... Uh, when, ye, when ye take of this feast, the children will say, what does it mean? And ye shall answer unto them and say, this is the Lord's Passover, when he passed over us in the land of Egypt, and we did not die. We read further in the book of Exodus chapter 12 and verse 14, the same chapter, verse 14 and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. That meant they were forever to recognize and remember this day of deliverance from the land of Egypt. They must never forget it. And it shall keep, and ye shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As long as there are Jews upon the face of this earth, may they must keep this memory. And ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. That means as long as this world stands as it is today, they are to do this. Now, for the Christian part of this, of this feast, may I open the Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, begin with verse 23. It says, I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is 
my body, which is broken for you. This do ye in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. There we have the New Testament ordinance. And our children rise up and say, Why do you take the Lord's Supper? Just as the Jewish children rise up and say, Why do you keep Passover? And we must respond to them if we wish to perpetuate what God has done upon the face of this earth. We must answer them. A priceless truth of salvation is involved in this lesson that makes it very important. It was salvation for the Jews in their Passover feast. It is to do with the salvation of the total world in the new covenant made by the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first thought would be, what was necessary when the Jews would take and keep Passover? What, what did they do? Number one, the Jews understood that it was necessary to have circumcision, that no one would certainly come to such a, a holy uh, service as Passover without circumcision. It, it could not, it was never done. And so it had to be done. And this made them different from all other people, all other nations, all other humans. Uh, they were the circumcised people. And this has a great meaning for us. Circumcision has to do with cutting off. And God, when we come before him to take the Holy Communion, we should cut off those things that are of the world and those things that are of sin and those things that are non-spiritual coming before the Lord for his Passover, we must cut off those things and enter with holiness in before the Lord. We must not go in unclean in our spirits or in our souls when we go in before the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing that the Jews had to remember regarding Passover that no stranger was invited to eat. This was not permissible. It was not possible. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 43, the Lord said unto Moses and to Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. Why would people be permitted to eat this when they had no understanding of it? Their forefathers were not in Egypt's bondage and they were not delivered that night. The death angel had not passed over because they were not there. And may I assure you that sinners, the unconverted, must not be asked nor invited nor permitted to receive the Holy Communion. The Word of God teaches us that those that do so in the New Testament have sickness among them and some die prematurely because they did not understand or comprehend the Lord's body. And so this is not a thing to be played with, and yet it's not a thing to be feared. If you belong to the Lord and you're a child of God and you know you're a child of God, we're not talking to you, but to the sinner from the street. He cannot just drop in for a Sunday morning service and take the Holy Communion because he happens to be seated in a pew. He must be born again. He must know what it means to be saved. He must have Christ in his heart. And then he must take the Holy Communion. And so strangers were not permitted. You could feed them bread, but you could not give them the, you could not give them the Passover. And so we must keep it clean and pure just as they, in Jesus' name. The third thing is found in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 9. At the moment of the Passover, the Jews were not permitted to have any leaven in their house. Now, this was not strangers this time. This was their own house. And they were told to light a candle and to look for leaven and to search in all places in the house. So if there was found leaven anywhere, they were to destroy it, take it out of the house so that there would be no leaven in the house. They were to look in the cupboard. They were to look in the stove. 
they would look any place, even where the children might have laid a piece of bread that had leaven in it, and they were to search it out and to throw it out. Responding to this, 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, we must search for the old leaven before taking the memorial, and we must light the, the candle of the Word of God and light that candle with the fire of the Holy Spirit and to clean out the old leaven before we come before the Lord. That old leaven is sin. That old leaven is uncleanness. That old leaven has to do with the things that, that have to do with this world that's away from God and far from God. Hatreds and, and lies and adulteries and stealings and all kinds of things that alienate a human from God. Now, this doesn't have to do with strangers. That has to do with those in the house, in the house. If you're going to live under the covenant and under the blessing, when it comes to the moment of the Passover, it's a cleanup time. For all of us, there has to be cleanup times. Some of us go through very difficult circumstances and, and very trying moments, and we need cleanup times. When we come before the Lord and we just clean out the old leaven, whatever it is, things that have taken us from the Lord, things that cause us not to pray as we should, things that robbed us of our joy that was bubbling within us so wonderfully and we lost the bubble, uh, until uh, we must come before him and clean the thing out, and, and God will bless us as we do. Then they, the children were to be told when they said, what means this feast? They were told then that in order for them to have their security, in Egypt, that they had to take a lamb, innocent lamb, and to take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the sides of the door and upon the lintels of the door, and that it was to be there before midnight. And at that time, an angel of God would pass through, and the only thing that would stop him from taking a life and a home, the oldest child in that home, the oldest son in that home, the firstborn in that home. The only thing that would stop him from doing it would be to see the blood on the doorpost. When God comes to salvation, he doesn't want ornaments. The doorposts of those people were rugged. They were not beautiful. They were rugged, possibly unhewn doorposts. The door was not a beautiful door like you have today, but something they had made with their own hands, not factory made whatsoever. It was a rugged thing. And he said, now place the blood upon there, but I want no, no flowers, I want no frills, and I want, I want nothing that speaks of your beauty. And our salvation is the same. When men start beautifying salvation and they stop talking about the cross, and they start talking about positive thinking. <laughs> You're going to find yourself a million miles from salvation. The cross is as rugged and awful as it was 2,000 years ago. That bleeding cross is just as nauseating as it was 2,000 years ago. And the only way to find salvation is for you to come to an old rugged cross. There's no need of bedecking it with, with silks and satins and with flowers with their beautiful fragrance. No, the, the altar must be simple, the altar must be plain, the altar must be crude. You must know that you're coming to the basics of, of the universe. You're coming to grips with eternal salvation. And therefore, uh, we must take it like it is. No beautifying it, no polishing it over to take away the ugliness of it. That old rugged cross is still the old rugged cross. And the great wise man Moses said generation after generation, tell your children this. Your children could very well be unbelievers and disbelievers. Uh, your children could very well say, we want an altar, but we don't want a sacrifice on it. We don't want blood. We don't like to hear people talk about blood. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility to get down to the basics and say, God told, beginning with the children of Israel, that when your children shall say, what does this mean? 
Tell them what it means. Let them know you were in bondage and that you have been set free and that it was the blood that covered. And you're saved uh, through the blood. What a, a beautiful situation there was. At the Jewish Passover time, the head of the house, the father, sat with his family at the table, usually unbroken, all there. When I lived in Jerusalem with my family, it was so interesting on Friday. You could hardly get a Jewish man that could work after 12 o'clock on Friday. He would become so nervous, he didn't know what to do. And if he was away from home, he, he went for a home as fast as a, as a Jewish man could go. We lived there for six or seven months, and we saw this every weekend. Uh, when it came Friday noon, to ask him to work was very difficult. I know Sabbath only began at sundown, but preparation for it began to move in his spirit by 12 noon. And you began to see people moving toward their homes, getting ready for the great Sabbath dinner, the Sabbath meal. And when it came to Passover time, it was much greater than just the weekly Sabbath. When the head of the house felt a, a responsibility to gather his brood close to himself, that he had a responsibility to tell them the truth. Oh, that we had fathers in America. Oh, that we had fathers in America. Forty percent of all the cases in our in our system that we have where we have to give food to the hungry and and, and care for those that are in great need. 40% uh, of these cases that have wives and children that are in great, in great uh, financial need are from broken homes where men have run off and left their wives and children and don't take care of them. We could clean up, multiply billions of dollars of wasted money if men would be fathers and if men would be husbands, like God, like God wants them to be. God save our men. And you men there, you're not supposed to be a weakling. God made you as the king of this universe. You read in the first chapter of Genesis, chapter 20, verse 26, and God said that you had dominion over everything that moves on the face of this earth. If it moves, you're the boss. It matters not whether it's a lion or a serpent. You're the boss. God made you that way. And in your own home, you're the head of the house. You're the chief. God help men that refuse to accept their place of responsibility before God. We want you to receive that responsibility. The head of the house, the man who was the head of the house, he took bread and he, he, he gave it under his family that they might eat. And he carried on this spiritual eating there at his own table, teaching the children and telling the story. And then they had a, a prophecy that before the Messiah came, Elijah would come. So they would leave an empty chair at the table and the children would say, what, what means the empty chair? And they would say, Elijah must come. And he will proceed. He will proceed the Messiah. And this is his chair. And at the end of the meal, the father would say to his son, go to the door. See if Elijah is coming. And we understand that as many as 13 times, this would be repeated. Go to the door and see if Elijah is coming. And finally, the father speaking to his family would say, Elijah has delayed his coming, meaning the Messiah had delayed his coming. How very sad it is that Elijah did come. His name was John Baptist, and he was a mighty prophet, and he did proclaim that the Messiah was coming and was among them, and he baptized him, and that Christ was that Messiah. And you and I must tell our children we must tell them at the Holy Communion table that Christ went to Calvary as the Lamb of God and that he gave his life to save us from our sins. 
And if we tell that story, fathers, as God wants us to tell it, and if we'll be the father that God has expected us to be, as those who have dominion on the face of this earth, we'll have happy homes and happy families and happy children. When Christ brought the new covenant, he sat at the head of the table and his family was his 12 disciples and apostles. And he said, with great desire have I desired to eat the Passover with you. And they went through the Passover as it had been for a thousand years with the people of Israel. And then he said, now I bring to you a new covenant beginning now, a new covenant. And then he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. I am the living seed. I am the grain that was planted that I might die and be resurrected and come back again and flourish and feed the total human race. My body that's broken for you. As I've told you, his bones were not broken, only his flesh. And Isaiah explained it when he said that by his stripes we are healed. Our children will not know this. And they will say, what mean you by taking the Lord's Supper? I don't believe it's correct for you to hand your little children the Lord's Supper. You say, why? They don't understand it yet. And I think they should come to a full understanding of what it means to receive Christ personally in their own lives. Otherwise, they will be partaking of something you should read in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And you find out that those who do not understand it are not supposed to take it. And for that reason, uh, some were sick and some were dead because they had taken of the communion of God without understanding its benefits, without understanding its purposes. And you mustn't do that. And after Jesus Christ had taken the bread, and had passed it to each one of his disciples. Then he took the cup and said, Now this is the New Testament in my blood, and I want you to drink this in memory of me. And they drank it. And the church was born. <laughs> and that was the chief ordinance of the church. And this is what we were to teach generations to do. How beautiful it is and how glad we are that you and I can come to the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're ready, let us come now to the table of our Lord. If you are sick in body, I want you to be healed by his mighty power. The Lord Jesus told you and he told me to take the bread and to eat it. And this was his body broken for us. And you can receive spiritual strength as you partake. Let us partake together in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for the body broken for us. We receive it and we accept it. And we pray that life shall flow through us and strength. May you receive healing now. I believe it and I thank him for it. Our master then took the cup and after he had supped, he said to his disciples, drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. This is the blood of the New Testament, just as the blood on the lintels and the doorpost of Egypt was the blood of the Old Testament. This is the blood of the New Covenant. Shall we at this moment drink together?
I thank you, Lord, for every drop of blood that was shed to save the world from its sorrows, from its sins. Let the blessing of God be strong. Let the blessing of God be powerful and forgiving in Jesus' name. Receive right now the strength of God, the blessing of God, because of the shed blood. We want you to receive it right now. 